Welcome everybody. This is uh, Dr. Perry and this is uh, the fourth video clip that we're creating uh, to help people in this current pandemic. The topic for the day is the sequence of engagement. And uh, if you give me a moment, I'm going to put up some slides and talk a little bit uh, about what we mean by sequence of engagement and uh, hopefully help you appreciate a little bit about why that concept can be really important uh, in the next couple of months. And actually for many of you, it can be an important concept that you can apply in a lot of different aspects of your life. So as I said, uh, this is the fourth in a series of presentations those of you who are interested, there's a lot of interrelated content from these previous presentations that will be uh, helpful when you're trying to watch this, but uh, it, it, this will stand alone. Uh, and uh, I think these concepts, again, like I said before, are pretty simple, but very useful. So let's just start with what we mean by sequence of engagement. And a lot of you have heard you know, the, the mantra, regulate, relate, and reason as it pertains to engaging uh, both children and adults who may be uh, dysregulated. And the, the, this, this heuristic, this little uh, model uh, I developed to basically communicate a couple of key points about the way the brain uh, works, and, and why uh, it's very difficult to reason with somebody when they're dysregulated, when they're distressed, when they're overwhelmed. And really it has to do with the basics of uh, the organization of the brain. And we'll get to that in one second, but let, let me just walk you through this, um, this little image here. So the upside, the upside down triangle uh, is something that we use all the time to represent the human brain. And the uh, top part is the cortex. It's the part of our brain that is capable of telling time. It's the part of our brain that's responsible for speech and language and abstract symbolic representation and all of the quote, cognitive aspects of our functioning are mediated by networks in the cortex. And so really, when you are talking with somebody, you are trying to get to their cortex. You're, when you're trying to reason with somebody, you're trying to get them to utilize systems in their cortex. Now, this is, you know, this is a wonderful part of the human brain. It's, it's what has allowed us to be so creative and so productive and inventive as a species. But one of the challenges with the cortex is, number one, it develops later in life. It's obviously present and works literally from birth, but it's undeveloped, it's immature, and, and the cortex doesn't really fully organize until you're probably 28 or 30 years old. Furthermore, the cortex is kind of hard to get to. You, you really have to go through other more primitive parts of the brain before you get to the cortex. And this is one of the key issues with communication, particularly with somebody who's dysregulated. And so what we know is that all external sensory input comes into lower parts of the brain and then basically gets processed and acted on in a sequence. And the lowest, most primitive parts of the brain kind of get first dibs on processing and acting on information. And then that, that goes up and there's this parallel processing activity that takes place in the more emotional parts of your brain. And ultimately, you get information, but it's been influenced by these lower parts of the brain. The information ultimately can get up to the cortex where you do your thinking. And so part of what we've tried to help people appreciate is that if you really want to reason with somebody, we know that the most effective way to engage the human cortex is through relational interactions. When people feel safe and they feel connected to the person that they're interacting with, they will be better capable of hearing accurately what that person is trying to communicate. Now, this engagement process, in turn, depends upon a 
sort of a minimal level of regulation in the person who you're trying to communicate with. And as I talked about on our last session, it also requires a certain degree of regulation on your part. So if you're regulated, you have a chance of helping the other person be regulated, of connecting with them, and then communicating with them. And this is really what the sequence of engagement is all about. It's appreciating that the way in which we communicate with each other really requires an awareness of this sequence. And if you adhere to the sequence, you're going to be much more effective at helping people understand, uh, helping persuade people, helping people internalize new concepts, and so forth. And really all the stuff that we're trying to do in this current situation with our peers, with children, uh, with our colleagues is, is help people uh, get regulated, help people stay connected to help buffer some of the stress, and then help people think about their behaviors in ways that will promote safety and uh, improve the probability that we will all get through this really challenging time uh, in the best way that we can. So again, the ability to use these really smart parts of our brain to reason and to reflect really requires that we are regulated to a certain degree. Let me talk about the challenge of this a little bit. So many of you have probably heard about Moravian's uh, meta-analysis and of some reviews about communication. And this is something that's kind of been distorted a little bit, but the bottom line is that it turns out that that the nonverbal aspects of communication are very, very important in getting uh, really the meaning and the intentionality of communication across. And the words are, are important, but relative to the nonverbal components uh, of communication, they're not as powerful. And I think a big part of that is related to this sequence of engagement. So let's, let's walk through this. So you know, the interesting and important thing is that when you're trying to get something from your cortex, a good thought or a belief or an idea, uh, it doesn't go directly to the other person's cortex. It has to go through your brain. And, and you know, your brain basically has, you know, you formulate your thought up here in the cortex. Uh, you will uh, send signals down through more emotional parts of your brain, out the lowest, most reactive part of your brain, into the ether. Uh, that will get processed and, and that will be sensed by the sensory apparatus of the person you're trying to communicate with, which then gets filtered and processed and acted on and passed up to a more emotional part of your brain and then ultimately into the cortex. And so there's at least this seven part process that can influence communication. And at, and at any one of these areas, the process can be interfered with by the previous history of the communicator or the previous history of the person who's being communicated to. Now, of course, I'm talking about communication as this one-way process now. We all know that it's a back and forth interactive process, but let's uh, you know, humor me for a second while I walk you through this. One of the things that is important to remember is that as the brain is developing and making sort of associations, connections between patterns of neural activity that co-occur, the brain is basically creating your personal internal representation of, of what the world is and what touch means and what sound means and what smells mean and what, and what smells go with which, which images and which images go with which sounds. And your brain's basically creating thousands upon thousands of associations, little, little connections uh, that have meaning for you that are based upon your personal experience. And so these associations uh, exist in all different parts of the brain. And you will have uh, these, what we would, what we're kind of calling these little filters, you know, 
and you may have a set of filters that are and based upon the way you grew up. And so when you're communicating to another person and, and your brain basically views them in a neutral way, there's no triggers uh, about them for you, what you communicate can come out without too much intensity or affect and it can be accurately portraying your, your, your cognition. Furthermore, if they have no internal associations that are evocative cues or implicit biases about you, the information can come in and get processed fairly accurately. So when you, you know, formulate a, a sentence and you say to somebody, I, we need to talk, it can actually be perceived as, I wonder what they want. Now, if you're a child who has had a history of rejection, and let's say you're a child in, in you're a foster child in the uh, child protective system, and an adult uh, says to them, "We need to talk," and it comes out in a neutral way. This history of relational rejection will turn that verbalization, even though there really was no intention to verbalize this, the verbalization will get turned into they don't like me, and if the verbalization is uh, basically given by an adult who's a little bit frustrated with this child because the school is called 10 times uh, in the last two weeks and we need to talk about this and that tiny little bit of frustration it comes out in the tone of voice and the facial expression of the, this adult, that's gonna even further influence the interpretation of this and the child can basically think that they hate me and, and they want me to be gone. And this is a really, really important you know, observation. This is something that those of you interested in implicit bias and, and, and racism and, um, and, and the, the inability to accurately communicate with people who are dysregulated, this is a fundamentally important concept. And let, let's just talk about what can happen if you are, let's say you're, you're just a, a math teacher and, and you're sitting around and you want to teach math, 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 and you've got all these great concepts in your cortex and you want to communicate them to somebody in your class. And so that'll have to get filtered out through the emotional part of your brain. And since you love math, there's no, you're not sort of spewing it out with sarcasm or anger or frustration. You may even be teaching this with enthusiasm, but because of this, because of the fact that your tone of voice, there might be certain attributes about the way you communicate that for this child are evocative. Let's say that this is an individual who the only men in his history were either hurtful or, or inconsistent or aggressive. And so you, even in your neutral communication, are carrying some evocative cues. And that's perceived by this child, by he's got these memories, as these associations that are created in different parts of his brain about attributes of men. And so in comes a, a, a math concept that's carried across space, but it's carried by a male voice. And it comes into the brain of one of these kids. It comes in neutrally, but it starts to be impacted by the, the, the filter that this child has and all of a sudden a math concept starts to activate a sense of dysregulation and discomfort and fear and as this gets increasingly processed by affective parts of the brain it runs up into another set of associations that were related but they're in different parts of the brain and that feeling of feeling unsafe gets magnified and pretty soon you know this kid starting to get more dysregulated simply by listening to a teacher talk about math. The math concepts are basically going up into the ether and they're getting dissipated and, and don't even get to the cortex. But the affective elements that this child has magnified, they have associated those attributes with threat, starts to activate this child's stress response. And he gets increasingly dysregulated and his brain basically starts to tap into other memories and the child literally in that moment learning math 
is doesn't feel safe. And this can lead to freeze behavior, shutdown behavior. It can lead to a, a, set, a de desire to flee. It can lead to uh, irritability and a fight response. And so what you're basically doing is with complete innocent intention, this teacher is teaching and it taps into this child's internal associations and, and it, his voice becomes an evocative cue. Undermining the ability of this child to learn and contributing potentially to a behavioral dysregulation this child may manifest. Now, you know, this is a, one of the big challenges that we have obviously in our, in all in our field. And as I talked about before, if, if you have a regulated adult and a dysregulated child, you have the potential to begin to shift the internal state of that child and make them feel more regulated. And this is something that's, again, all of these things happen in a sequential manner. That the more we appreciate the sequential processing, the more we recognize that there are times when words aren't going to help and there's times when words are going to be processed accurately. But if you adhere to the sequence of engagement and you make sure that you're regulated so that you can take advantage of relational contagion and you can regulate a child to a certain degree, you'll be able to effectively connect with that child and then have a much higher probability of being able to reason with them. And again, one of the things that you're going to be seeing in the current situation is a lot of people who are very dysregulated, who are using more primitive parts of their brain to problem solve and the solutions and their capacity to interpret complex new information is going to be compromised. And so if you, you remember just the simple principle to regulate somebody, then connect, and then reason with them, you'll be much more successful in your efforts to communicate. Our next session is going to be about understanding regulation, and we'll go through a, a whole bunch of uh, options that you have to self-regulate and to regulate other people. And we'll talk about the underlying neurobiology of that, and hopefully that, again, will be something that you can add to your toolkit, and it will help you in your work. Uh, those of you who want uh, more information about this stuff, uh, these are going to be posted on this website, the neurosequential.com COVID-19 resources, and a deeper dive into any of this content is available through any of these uh, links here. All right. Stay physically apart, but emotionally connected. And I'll, I'll be back and we'll talk about some of this stuff uh, tomorrow or the next day.